we are telling ourselves that as Africans we must have African solutions to African problems and that we can do the things that we desire in a manner that is uniquely African so that we can improve our agriculture, so that we can improve our industries, so that we can improve our health. Many of you here will remember that African countries have times without number uh, analyzed our problems in the aviation sector. The Yamasukuru protocol is designed to open the African skies. What we are saying, let us implement it. Social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube would have to be part of any serious effort to enlighten young Africans about the past, considering that 70% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa are under 30 years. We should make Africa the center for the freshest ideas for innovation and development. And within our innovations and our culture, the need for us to come together, absorb our collective strength, our latent energies, and unleash the potential power. As we know what the problems are. We've talked about them in so many fora. What we need now are solutions. That has simple solutions. Solutions that all our scholars can help to make in such a way that they can become part of national strategies. I think the challenge that we that we have both as a as an African uh, you know, across Africa, but also globally, is we don't believe enough in our own ability to create our own solutions. I think there's a false dichotomy that we believe that we are not good enough, uh, that we must import this and import that and come up with this technology. I think that's a falsehood. So for Africa to sustain growth momentum, and indeed for its people to harness the benefit through long-term improvement of quality of life, we need to rethink the definition of innovation, formulate supportive policies to include all property assets, IP, copyrights, trademark, formal, informal, to include registry and valuation of unique African assets. And I'm talking about health because I come from the health uh, background. I believe that we have health problems, that only Africa can solve their own health problems. We cannot export solutions for our health problems. Uh, Egypt has had um, a huge impact in, uh, on the whole world with its exemplary model for elimination of hepatitis C. Uh, we exported the drugs, but we also made our own drugs at a very, very low price. And we even are making our raw material. And that's why now, even with the disruption that's happening with the COVID-19, we are not short of medications. We're still producing our own medicine, even with the shortage in the supply chain. So I believe that we can have our own solutions. Africa cannot unite and integrate without infrastructure. We need the roads, the railways, the telecommunication systems, the ports, airports, and so on. We cannot man build manufacturing capacity without electricity. We cannot transport food across different regions of Africa without cold chain, cold chain logistics, uh, the infrastructure that supports warehousing and trade. We cannot power Africa for education and health. Even in this COVID crisis, electricity has become one of the key infrastructures that has been needed. So that's why I argue of the importance of infrastructure. My argument is the following. When you look at any problem, there's a cause and effect. The infrastructure is the effect and the institution is the cause. And if you don't actually have the cause, you will never get the effect. So therefore, once the infrastructure is realized, of course, it unites the continent. But before you get to the infrastructure, before you get to the effect, you have to deal with the cause. And that cause is, is a project institutionally feasible. If it's not the case, that infrastructure will never see the day. So that's the reason why I say it comes before infrastructure. If we have really to develop innovation in Africa, first and foremost, skills development is very vital. Then secondly, we need to invest in research and development. And the third, we need to invest in the design institutes across Africa. Mm. When we have done that, we are able to really capture value, as has been stressed during this uh, uh, discussion, that we should compete on the value. What we are doing now, 
So for me, like um, uh, uh, Frank said, it's chicken and egg. They have to, we have to get them together. And um, I will agree with uh, Ibrahima that yes, some things we have done in the past and we, they fail, we fail in, in them. Uh, it gave the collapse of the airline. Now it is a matter of, of leadership. Our leader did not understand how these things work in the larger world until it collapses and then we find because the aircraft the air Africa, nigeria airways all of them collapse about the same time and except for, uh, except for the um uh, ethiopian airways today uh, there's really no african airline that uh, you can write home about now that is something that you engage our nation thank you very much for this opportunity that I don't think the first goal should be to take African startups global. Because what that means is one or two people in Africa get rich selling stuff to people outside Africa. And I'm much more interested in funding startups that are actually creating capacity within African countries, including, you know, I, I wish the government would take a lot more of its money and spend it on education. But I was also an investor in Get Smarter which offered online college courses. And most of what I do is, is focused on companies that are making African economies more efficient. We said from January 2017, we would, uh, to 2021 December, we should aim to fund our business with $10 billion of funding from Africa. Now we created a department called the Africa Resource Mobilization Unit. So our people come there every day. The only thing they do is to go and get money from Africa to organize it, to use to solve Africa's problem. And we created the products to do that. And I tell you, in less than two years, we raised just slightly under $6 billion. As we speak today, we raised more than $14 billion. Answer. And, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a creative entrepreneur because I do try to, you know, I organize events to make money. I do fashion events. We having the TV. and But it's so hard. Sometimes I just like, oh, how can we just move forward? And, and how right. can these people can help us? Trying to fundraise has been hard but uh, i and i have a product and uh, i have i have a collateral and uh, trying to get those very you know squeaky clean as we call it over the board uh, institutions well, well, well let me just say hard. here that, that we've got lots of clean sources of money on the continent and you're looking at one of them uh, <laughs> professor benedict i'm sure you guys can have a conversation afterwards but but adama let me let me come to you uh, Without much support, people like Adama, people like Vanya have started doing that. And we have so many like that in our, 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 across our continent. But after Zimbabwe had decided to come and do something also. Uh, I'm actually surprised that you, you, you have not approached us. Um, um, granted, we, we only recently launched our Creative Africa um, strategy. Uh, but even before then, we've been uh, financing uh, companies uh, of the type you are you, are, you, you, you described, but right, um, uh, uh, we launched it just before the COVID, so uh, things are not uh, fully picked up the way we thought they would. But please um, uh, send us your uh, whatever you think we could do to support in terms of investment. We're engaging with the African Bank. I was glad to see Dr. Arama on the platform earlier. So I think by creating this enabling environment where all types of partnerships are going to be able to flourish using the convening power of sport and basketball in particular in this, in this specific area. It's not just the 12 or 24 players who will be playing that day, but also the, the broadcasters, you know, the people who are going to provide the entertainment uh, in the arena, the people who are marketeers because you got to sell this product you got to package it and market it to fans you want to drive them to the arena so we set up this thing called african echoes 
Now, what we essentially do is that we pick up regular Africans. Some of, most of them can't even speak an international language or English or French or anything like that. We, they tell us stories in local language. We have a team that packages the stories and then we translate these stories. We, we basically tidy them up and translate them into uh, uh, African language and then also into the big languages, English, French, Mandarin and that kind of thing. And we sell over the phone. And this is what we're doing. But it's very exciting because, you know, this whole thing should be launching around December. You will find very soon a millionaire old lady in a village in northern Nigeria who's just sold three million books in China. I am investing on my people so they can have a better life. I'm not just giving them an aid, but building the hospital is not an aid. Because when you build the institution, we're talking about a medical institution that costs more than 30 some plus million dollars. First, just the construction of the institution did create more than 2,000 jobs. By the time the institution was open, I have more than 420 doctors and nurses that work for me. And those doctors and nurses that work for me, you have family, you have wife and children. And uh, so you talk about human capital that you have created. You create a, a world that's helping the children to go to school, helping the mom to have a better health, helping the grandmother. A lot of African stories are told from a mediocre point of view, right? Mm. We keep focusing on what Africa was a couple of hundred years ago. We're not talking about what Africa is today, and we're not even really visualizing what Africa could be. So I believe that we don't need to have an identity that covers everything, but let's tell it how it was at every segment of time and in every area, because we're diverse. It's our diversity that makes us beautiful. Even in our clothing, the various prints, the various symbols, the various languages, it's those diversities that if we harness and bring it out truly, we can create a unified, diverse identity for each period of Africa. And the sad thing is that the children today, my little boy, um, is growing up reading just different versions of the same foreign tales because we still don't have, 30 years later, um, our own stories easily accessible for children and it's not rocket science. Um, I sort of created um, Idriblast Dynamic Development UK Limited, which is the IDD, um, as an well, to create an alternative platform to showcase artists, especially artists who live outside the catchment areas of art. So for example, those who are in the countryside or in rural areas who do not get the sort of visibility that artists who live in the city would have. Because we need partners to understand that unless we invest in this sector, this revolution is going to leave us. Our storytelling that is so rich and so um, uh, in, um, embraced by other parts of the world is going to be, be, be used by other people the way we are seeing Maasai cloth being used by other people and we are not going to actually leverage on it. We talk a lot about Africa, uh, but it tends to be talk, not doing. And everything that gets done, and, and, and these two very inspiring stories that we've heard from Adama and Vanya of what they've done in the fashion and jewelry business. But you know, the interesting thing is that one of them's in France and one of them's in the UK. And what really needs to be done is to integrate the continent, if that is possible. So we have to start changing the narrative. Again, I'll go back to saying, you know, Africans have to understand that, you know, those that are helping us are also benefiting from it. So you can help people and benefit. So, you know, for Africans not to shy away uh, of Africa, thinking that it's just, you know, all about aid. No? I'm actually a, an industrialist uh, in the sense that we do everything from uh, uh, growing cotton. We have our own plantations. We uh, we gin that cotton, uh, we do spinning, we do knitting, we do weaving, we do apparel. So basically we're doing the full value chain from the field to the fashion. Not many people in the world do the, this type of business. You know, the, the textile apparel business is actually done uh, in verticals and it's not horizontally big. And what we've done in Africa is we've decided that 
we need to change the paradigm. We need to change the narrative. We cannot compete with China on price or with India on price. And maybe need to be con competing with them on value. We need to ensure that you're not only talking about commodity dependence, but also cultural dependence. And that's where the storytelling, the creatives come in. And that's why it's very important to acknowledge Afro, um, Afrexim Bank and others who are investing in the creatives, because that's where the authentic voice of Africa lies. This, my view is that diversification is necessary, but you can only obtain it if the government comes up with a program that support this kind of diversification. So um, just some of the earlier points raised around originality of concept. I, I say that is very important, you know, because we, if we look at Africa and we look at all the challenges we have in the operating environment, those challenges are actually opportunities. 70% uh, of the population don't have access to electricity. So nowadays, there's a lot of um, opportunity in the sector. If you take the rural areas, there is a lot of opportunity of connecting those uh, connect, uh, communities with uh, solar kits, solar home system, with mini grids. So one of the things we suggest and we start is to do a public-private partnership with government where we could bring those kits. Seen a, a lot of interest especially when it comes to fashion, right? When it comes to fashion, when it comes to some basic staples, uh, you know, grocery items, that people are really hungry to find something that is authentic. The opportunity for African entrepreneurs is really to, to raise the, the scale of their ambition, to, to, to think global, even though they're local, but think global and, and, and uh, assert themselves. And, they and the private sector has to be highly involved and to define to, the, to, 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 to define the, the, the policies. Investing in capacity building and expertise, uh, expertise sharing expertise sharing goes by attracting talent. African talent, the one that leaves the continent and the one that leaves abroad. Cool segment. We all know that the large number of jobs and the future of sustainability and stability in Africa has to do with MSMEs. There's no question about that. The virtues have been very well uh, elaborated over the past decade or so. It's very clear that the real question really is how does one scale up capacity and support for these different uh, types of uh, small businesses? And I think the, the I think Esther made references to the role of government. I think governments have an important role to play to deal with you know, streamlining regulation, dealing with investment climate issues, cost of doing business. Continent. And the integration is very important, is a very important aspect because we really need to do a lot of uh, disseminate this agenda, agenda 26 to 3. And it is through this agenda that we get all these results and all these type of, uh, you know, uh, initiatives that we want to see our country. Again, the BOMA of Africa is a platform for all this interaction to take place so we can push toward the implementation of the continental free trade area. That would be our best caution, our best stimulus in a time where people are injecting money in Europe, in Asia. If we implement the continental free trade area, I think we will have a capability to trade among ourselves and it will be the best question against any crisis at the global level. As Pana BIOS is a virtual platform, we then allow people to access their test and vaccination results digitally, giving them certificates to allow cross-border travel. This is a campaign to harness brand power, design, heritage and technology to connect Africa's SME fashion designers with global markets. BOMA of Africa launched a prize program to uncover artistic visions and discover talent with a 50,000 US dollar grand prize for investments into the winner's new project. Indlela Ibuza Kwabapambili. That is a Zulu proverb that is translated as the way forward is to ask those who have gone before. Nefertiti. 
my beloved. Sweet, sweet, sweet of love. Lady of all women, of all great. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Ni Aikwe Parks, a famous and very successful, very inspirational writer, joining us from London to please announce uh, the winners for us and, of course, to read the citation for us. So allow me, please, to welcome Ni Aikwe Parks. So I think what's important that we forget is that what is written, what is communicated from the continent in writing, influences how our trading partners think of us and um, how they might be inspired to come and speak to us or trade with us. And so it's really important that even things that can't be documented as dollars and, and um, any kind of currency that you want to think of must be seen as um, wealth. It's part of our wealth. It's also why we are still connected with our cousins in the diaspora because they recognize at the core that we share a common story and that brings them back as tourists or as investors. And now that we're in lockdown, I'm sure many of you have been reading books and watching films. And it's an economy that revolves around content and content comes from us dreamers who write these stories. Um, I believe that in the category for literature, we had many wonderful um, entries, but um, ultimately there, there can only be one winner. Um, it is my pleasure to present the award to a young African artist, writer from Kenya, um, in recognition of his um, entry um, as the winner of the Literary Excellence Prize. His name, and I'm trying to save his name for the last, <laughs> is Peter Wambua. Um, he paints a picture of an Africa that's resilient and is resolute in transforming its narrative and out of pain creating beauty. Um, congratulations to Peter Wambua from Kenya. You are the winner. I believe this is the first Literary Excellence Prize from the AU. Congratulations, Peter. This is the prize that we have named the African Renaissance Prize. This is the African Renaissance Prize, and it is sponsored by ADS Group. Now, this is a prize that is in recognition for work that draws on themes of development, of knowledge, of innovation, of integration, of ingenuity, and of transformation. And to announce the winner and to give us a citation for this particular prize, for the African Renaissance Prize, it gives me great pleasure for me to cross over the seas and connect in Atlanta with Dikembe Mutombo, NBA Global Ambassador. Dikembe, over to you, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much for asking me to present such a wonderful award to our young African artist named Sinekosi uh, Somi uh, from Swaziland in recognition for his, out, his outstanding artist contribution that you have earned him this winner of the African Renaissance Prize. So I'm so happy to present this award. And now we turn our focus to the Social Justice Prize. The Social Justice Prize sponsored by MTN. Sponsored by MTN. And this is a prize that recognizes works that draw on themes of social change, of justice, of inclusion, of equity, equality, struggle, and anti-oppression. To help me announce this particular winner for the Social Justice Prize, it's a great honor for me to please welcome the African Union Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security, and Chair, of course, of Femme Afrique Solidarité, or FAS. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome um, Ambassador Benito Benetta Dio uh, to please make the announcement. Agriculture is very important. We also know we need to feed Africa. Africa feeding Africa. 
we need also to look in the system of education and our system of health. So I'm very happy to see that it's a young, brilliant woman, a young African artist named Berta Muntali from Malawi. And we recognize her outstanding contribution um, when she designed what you, in the title of the winner of the Social Justice Prize for her work. She paints a picture of an African beauty through animation, and I'm sure that you have seen the animation, advocating for the return to agriculture and inclusion on the continent. I think that as a woman, 70% of the people in the business of agriculture are women and the young generation. So we need to clap for her. Thank you. And so with great honor, great privilege for me to uh, invite our former president of Nigeria, uh, who is joining us from Abu Okuto in Southwest Nigeria, ladies and gentlemen, to announce the winner of the Nefertiti Grand Prize. Please help me welcome His Excellency, President Olusugen Obasanjo. Over to you, Your Excellency. And without vision, there is no progress. So all of you who have participated, you have made us to have a feeling and a sense that we are really on the path of progress in Africa. That brings me to having the pleasure to present this award of Nefertiti Grand Prize, as you have heard, is worth $50,000 to a young African artist named Vincent Kolo from Nigeria. That even makes me again proud in recognition of his outstanding artistic contribution that has earned him the title of winner of the Nefertiti Grand Prize for African Creativity. He presents harrowing structures that bound womanhood to Africa, to Africa's past and present. Daunting in its expanse, even despite the constraints. Vincent Colo, congratulations and well done to all of you. If we have really to develop innovation in Africa, first and foremost, skills development is very vital. Then secondly, we need to invest in research and development. And the third, we need to invest in the design institutes across Africa. Mm. When we have done that, we are able to really capture value, as has been stressed during this uh, discussion, that we should compete on the value. We are able to, uh, to compete on that because one, we've got a very differentiated product which is made in Africa. And it is designed to be very attractive so that we brand the product as made in Africa. Now, to achieve that, and this is the, my message, there's need for the governments across Africa. There's need for the private sector across Africa. And there's also need for academia uh, 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 across Africa to collaborate more effectively across these areas. Let us collaborate in investing in skills, industrial skills development, so that we have across the continent, manufacturing and agro processing institutes. Let us collaborate in the development of design institutes across Africa. Let us collaborate in investing in research and development. Without that collaboration, we will not reach, reach the scale 
the scale that is required for Rati to compete uh, uh, quite effectively. So, like I indicated, I can go on and on that uh, there are quite a number of uh, range of uh, 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 partnerships. Uh, but and we at UNDP, we're exploring a partnership uh, which is going to really focusing on the accelerating development across Africa. And we've agreed that uh, when that is uh, finalized, uh, that program is going to be uh, in the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area in Ghana, uh, Accra. So we have quite a wide range of collaborating networks, and uh, uh, without that, I think it would be difficult to achieve much. All these uh, discussions that have been uh, talking on, uh, going on uh, since the first uh, January, and since the first July, uh, as we go up to seventh of July, when we are going to have the final commemoration of Africa Integration Day. They have been made possible through collaboration. And of course, you're also a collaborator in the African Business Forum. Thank you.